Yeah, good. Well, uh, we're going to launch this new series, which I'm pretty pumped about. All right, awesome. Uh, we are looking at this series called The Good News, and uh, we, uh, I'm excited about this. This is a day of good news. Anybody believe that? But uh, Revolution is a church uh, of good news. Yeah. Amen? Good news! It's good news. Uh, I made the uh, mistake last Sunday in my promotion of saying, you know, when, when was the last time you read the newspaper and just were bombarded by good news? And all the millennials were like, what's a newspaper? <laughs> so uh, there you go. Uh, but uh, good news, good news. The world, we hear enough bad news around us. And sometimes I think uh, that the church or the gospel uh, gets an gets a, a association or a connotation of being bad news, you know, kind of sounds like, oh, you're all terrible sinners, you know, you mongrels, uh, whatever, you know, I, I don't know. Um, and sometimes we've presented a gospel like that, and you know, we've got to make sure that we don't ne- neglect the aspect of the gospel that confronts sin and what that truly is, but the overwhelming, overarching message that we are here to proclaim is Good news. I just personally happen to feel like I was born to proclaim good news and call people into it. Uh, And it's beautiful and it's powerful and it's transformational. Uh, Many, I think, uh, unfortunately, many uh, Jesus followers today get a bit familiar with the gospel or the good news. Gospel, good news, same thing. We'll use them interchangeably. I'll explain that in a while. Uh, But, you know, really understanding and living in the good news spells an end to, uh, to any spiritual sort of apathy and lethargy that can often creep in in the church in our faith journey. Um, you know, some people go like, yeah, 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 I know the gospel, now can I move on? There's no moving on from the gospel. The gospel is the center of the Christian experience and Christian faith. The challenge is, is the gospel going deeper and deeper into our lives and changing and transforming all of who we are? And if you become stagnant in your faith, and probably no one here has, but if you become stagnant in your faith, I would suggest the center of that issue is that the gospel has stopped being allowed access to go deeper in our lives. We can change that, right? Yep, going to get a bit passionate about this one. <laughs> There's nothing... Uh, well, let me, let me put it this way. Imagine someone gave you a power drill, or you won a power drill at the, uh, you know, uh, Father's Day gathering or something like this, and you've got this power drill, and you put the you put the Thompson bit in it, or you put the Phillips bit in it, or whatever, and you've got a screw, and you go and get it, and you click it into lock position, and you hold it, and you just wind it. Imagine that. This is a great screwdriver. It gives me a little bit more leverage, you know, than this little thing. I've got leverage, and so I can go a little bit further with it. You know, imagine doing that. That'd be amazing. A- amazing. Apart from you've neglected like eighty percent of the design and the features and the functionality of that power drill. Was anybody all right with power drill illustrations out there? I was, I was trying to think of different sort of analogies from different perspectives. Hair dryer. Imagine a hair dryer. And you put the comb on the hair dryer. You never plug it in, but you're just combing with the, with the end, hoping that it's going to dry. Well, your hair will dry, but you actually didn't need the, the hair dryer. Any other illustrations? You know, I'm just trying to... That was quite good. Thanks, Heather, for that. Oh, over your head, that wasn't hair dryer at all. Okay, all right. Uh, sadly, sadly, some people in church, when we come to a series like this, don't see the importance of what we're talking about. Oh, it won't matter so much if I don't go on a Sunday when we're talking about the good news, because I already know the good news. Well, you are the exact reason I'm doing this series, because you, you, that, that way of thinking is going to limit and restrict the impact of the gospel in your lives. We've become familiar too often. Now, also in the the series, uh, if you know people that uh, haven't really had an experience with the gospel, then bring them along in this series. I think it's going to be really, really helpful for people uh, in that space as well. But I don't think, uh, you know, when people go make this point, well, I I know the gospel, and so, uh, you know, I want want to move on. I I think the reality is we never know the gospel fully this side of eternity. And so this is the adventure the, the exploration of the depth and the richness of the gospel. We're all right? So what I'm believing for in this series is that God touches and transforms our hearts and minds afresh with this good news that we celebrate. That being said, let's start in Romans chapter 1 this morning. I'm going to do a bit of a walkthrough of these first few verses, and then I'm going to give you a couple of applications and... Uh, uh, an observation and an application. We're all right with that? 
We're excited about diving into Scripture this morning. Are we sitting there with a heart that says, God, as we look at Scripture, speak to me by your Spirit? Oh, I am. All right, Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of, the, of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, that is a herald or a proclaimer, set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who, he, uh, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David and through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we have received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to obedience that comes through faith for his namesake. And you also are among these Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Verse 7, to all who are in Rome and all who are loved by God and called to be his people, his holy people, grace and peace be to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm just going to skip ahead to verses 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, there's that word again, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness of God is revealed. The righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Now, this is a powerful passage of Scripture, uh, profound. I, I can't do this justice in one message. There's a lot in here, so I'm just going to kind of give you a quick overview but the, some of these verses sparked the Reformation. In fact, it's been said uh, by one of uh, the, 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 the world's current leading New Testament scholars, a guy called N.T. Wright. He says, every time the church has taken the book, of gospel, uh, the book of Romans seriously, it has done profound things for the church. Radical things, outrageous things. The church has been reignited in the purposes of God afresh. And so my prayer is that we look at Romans for a little bit. And we're not doing a walkthrough of the whole book of Romans. We'll do that at some point in the journey of revolution, no doubt. But I want us, even as this morning, as we look at something that is here in the start of the book of Romans, it would do something outrageous and radical in our lives. And I'm going to pray to that end. And I've just titled this thought this morning, It's Bigger and Better. It's bigger and better. Father, thank you for scripture that you've given us. I thank you for your love towards us. And I pray that as we talk about and discuss and take these moments together and then have another time of worship, would you move in our hearts and reveal to us another glimpse of the beauty, the power, the profoundness of the gospel. Awaken us to the reality of your presence with us, in us, and through us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you ready for a little bit of a walkthrough of these verses first? Good, good, good. All right, gospel, uh, this is the word that Paul uses here. Just going to quickly uh, explain that that means literally good news. Now, it, it wasn't a, a biblical term or it wasn't a Judea term. It was a Roman term. It was an empire term. And so the Romans would use this uh, term of the gospel or an evangelist of the gospel or euangelions, proclaimers, heralds. And how they would use that is that they would say, uh, uh, good news. The, these heralds would go out and say, hey, this is a day of good news. Rome has defeated the Germanic. He actually didn't very often, but I'll just say that for today. The Germanic barbarians. He has conquered them. We are at peace once more. Hail great Caesar. Caesar, the son of God, is Lord of all and provides peace and prosperity to all us, his faithful citizens. Or, or, or the good news, a herald would go to a city. Hey, there is good news. The son of God, Caesar, is coming to visit this city. Prepare, because he is going to arrive. You know, that, that was how they would use uh, good news. Uh, in that day. And so the apostles and Jesus latch onto this and think, this is, this is profound. This is beautiful. What a great way of describing the gospel. What a great way of describing the work of God in humanity that he was trying to point us to. Now, there's one gospel. Let me just put that out there. Uh, we, we, in our attempt to try and explain the gospel, and, 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 and it's kind of a good thing. It's kind of like, a, can, we, can we kind of explain another facet of the gospel? We'll talk about that. 
uh, like the diamond has facets. We say things like, well, at this church, we preach the gospel of the salvation. Or another church says, oh, we preach the gospel of the kingdom. Or we preach the gospel of grace. It's another way of saying, there's an aspect that we've lost sight of, but it's one gospel. And, and probably we shouldn't do it. We should probably just say the gospel. I mean, if it was me and I was saying that we've lost sight of an, an aspect of the gospel, I'd say, well, here, we preach the, the gospel of King Jesus. So I think we've lost that aspect. But anyway, you know, it's all the one thing. It's just like, hey, it's rich. It's bigger than we think. It's more beautiful. It's more powerful. With that in mind, let us be faithful to the gospel as a group of people. Let it shape everything about us. And if the book of Romans, to get into these verses, is, is like a rocket ship that's planning to go into outer space and kind of like... What we think Paul is doing here is he's about to launch us into uh, an exploration of the cosmos of the gospel. Like, you know, the beauty, the, the, the book of Romans is powerful and profound. Uh, and every rocket that's about to launch needs a, a launching pad that's well constructed to begin its journey with. And that's what the first seven verses are, if you like. It's a launching pad for Paul to send this message of the gospel into uh, for us to understand. Now, he starts, as any classical writing in the day does, he starts with an introduction, which is saying who he is and who the letter is for. But if you look very carefully, you'll find that what he's done is he started, verse 1 said, Paul, the servant of Christ, called in his apostle. And he doesn't get to who it's for until verse 7, where he finally says to all who are in Rome and are called by God to be his holy people. And what he's done is he's sandwiched five verses in between his introduction. And that is unusual for classical writing. Uh, and he's done that for very good reason. He's done that to, 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 to draw our attention to uh, the importance of something known as the good news of the gospel. In other words, he's saying the gospel is going to underline everything I'm about to write in this book. And he goes on and says, it even defines my life because he talks about how I've been called uh, as a, an apostle, a hero to the gospel. So he's saying, you know, part of introducing who I am, I can't say who I am without explaining the gospel because the gospel, as he's going to go on and explain it, he says, is going to create a map by which you can view the entire world and where you belong in it. So he's going he's to launch us into this a massive overview of the, of the beauty and the power of the profoundness of the gospel. What he's going to do in the middle here is he's going to claim that the gospel, uh, sorry, he, he, he claims in these first few verses, he goes, hey, look, now I just want to let you know that the entire world, uh, or the gospel claims the entire world for Jesus. And it's important to know this because he's saying including Rome. Uh, you might, might have looked over that, but he goes on. He says, you know, the gospel promised beforehand of the Son, uh, and he gets... Through it, in verse 4, and he says, uh, by the second part of verse 4, he says, By his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, what he's doing here is he's writing to a group of people in Rome, which is very troubling because Rome happens to be the home to the most powerful man on earth. As I've already said, they his title was the Son of God, Caesar. Uh, and it also happened to be... Uh, his birth, Caesar's birth, that in the ancient world was proclaimed as the day of good news. Uh, a man who commanded the allegiance of the entire world. Caesar. Paul knows what he's doing. Straight out of the gate, he is proclaiming Jesus is the true king and true Lord and Caesar is not. And you're going to have to work out how to live in a city that's all about Caesar and live a life that's all about Jesus. So what's going on? So this is subversive. I mean, this is why, the, this is why Paul was driven out of city after city, uh, as we looked at in the book of Thessalonians, because he had this subversive, revolutionary, world-changing, completely uh, against the man message. And he knows what he's doing. He's saying Jesus is the Son of God. He ex explains it. All these titles that Caesar had, Jesus appropriates them to Jesus. Uh, he says Jesus is the Son of God. He goes through and says, and by the way, you think your king comes from something? Well, this king comes from a time well before Rome even existed. He's the king in the line of David. 
He goes, he's just, he's just one-upping Caesar all the time with his message of Jesus. It's quite beautiful and life-threatening <laughs> all at the same time. Uh, he goes, hey, you know, you talk about your Caesar's victory over this, that, and the other thing. Well, this Savior has victory even over our greatest enemy, death. He was raised from the dead, right? You see what's going on now? You get a little bit more of the context. He is just playing them off and he's saying, well, Caesar did this, Jesus is better. Caesar did this, Jesus is better. Caesar overcame his, <laughs> wow, Jesus overcome every possible enemy that could ever stand against human flourishing. Jesus is Lord. And I've been called, he goes on, he says, I've been called to carry this good news. It's not a message primarily about what can happen for you. Get that? It's a message primarily about something that has happened that for all time will change the world. Now you get the opportunity to be part of it. That's a distinction that we need so desperately in our postmodern consumeristic mindset. Oh, the gospel is a message about me. No, it's not. <laughs> it includes what's been done for you. But the center of the message, believe it or not, is not you, it's Jesus. And I'm grateful for that. <laughs> well, someone very different than Caesar exists. And Caesar, by the way, is Lord, and if you want to have a life in the Roman Empire, you have to submit to him, but someone's very different with a different power is truly Lord, and he's going to spend the rest of the book explaining what that looks like and how to live out the life of allegiance to the gospel of Jesus. Eventually, Paul erupts with passion, and I skipped ahead to that part where he goes, oh, you know, I'm just reminding himself, I'm not ashamed of this message, because it's the power of God. Under salvation. What's going on there? He's saying everywhere it's proclaimed, something happens. Something dynamic happens. Something powerful happens. Something radical happens. Something revolutionary happens. A new, the new world that Jesus began comes into life in people's hearts and minds as they hear it. God's power is released to transform humanity as the gospel is proclaimed. How good! There is something powerful when we hear the gospel. The new world that Jesus came springs in, to bring springs into life. The result, he talks about this idea of salvation, for the salvation of all who had believed. In other words, God rescues a person from their sin and brings them into his work of bringing his new world here on earth. And one day he's going to complete it, which is what he gets to finally in chapter 8. The, new, the creation groaning and longing for, excuse me, the sons of God and daughters of God to be revealed so the creation is put right. And this salvation is for everyone who believes. And then he goes on and he gives the big picture, which is the theme of the book. And he says, God's righteousness is revealed. So that's, that's the big theme of the book of Romans. Uh, we don't use that word a lot today, and so it's a tricky one, and we'll, we'll talk about it a lot in this series. Uh, it doesn't trans it's not a, it's not a good word in english uh, but in part it has to do with answering this question of if, if there's a loving god if god who created everything will god do anything about the sin and the pain in the world and the answer is yes he calls a family out to himself to represent him, and that was Israel. And then he says that through Israel, he will bring a restorer who will bring about his restorative justice to every part of creation. He will set the world right. He will set you right as you trust him. And through you, he will set the rest of the world right. And that's the message of Jesus, putting the world right by putting you right because of his great work, which we'll get to next Sunday probably and beyond. And everyone who responds in faith, which is not just to believe something, it's to believe, trust, and become loyal to, everybody who responds in faith gets caught up and becomes part of this big, beautiful story. Now, that said, that's my overview of those verses and what's going on there. We're all right with that. This guy here, 
Ours is a generation, or ours is an age of what I call a miniature gospel. And that's my first point, my first observation. I mean, cute, right? This little cute little fella here. I've, I got 30 of them hidden around my office. So, but it turns, turns out that they're handy, and I give them away every now and again. Um, so I'm getting less. In fact, one of, my, one of my kids and I have this game where we hide Jesus in different parts of each other's room, and then you've got to find him and put it back. And anyway, um, cute, cute, wee little Jesus. Uh, have you ever wondered about why? the church when it began was hunted down like the romans were just so uh concerned about this sect um of what they called atheists which were really concerned about atheists because they didn't have a temple to go to or a statue to worship so they're like they didn't even have a god these christians um and they kind of like you know there's they're, they're into incense because they have these love feasts and and although they thought all sorts of think, weird things about the early church. And all that was happening, and they were ostracized from society. And yet, with that said, 2,000 years, the church carrying the message of the gospel has changed the world. A lot of people talk today about things like human rights. Isn't it good? Well, we've all got humans, right? There is no such thing as human rights in today's culture without the church. It didn't exist in classic culture. It just didn't. It wasn't there. It wasn't a thing. Children weren't given any dignity. They were, you didn't like them, you discard them. Uh, uh, human, we celebrate human rights. It's because of the church. Do you know why you can read and write today, even though you're not the top 5% of wealthiest people on the earth? Because thousands of years, only the wealthiest people have an education. Do you know why you can read or write today? Because the church decided to codex Scripture to teach people to read and write so that you could have access to Scripture and discover God through the Bible for yourself. That is the only reason there is an education system that is available to anybody. Did you know that? The, 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 the message of the gospel lived out, changed everything about the world. Don't have to take my point of view for it. Uh, Tom Holland, who's not a Christian, wrote a book called Dominion, and he explains that way better than what I can. The gospel message changed the world and it's changing the world today but somewhere along the line contemporary church and the culture put Jesus through the wash and then through the dryer I think <laughs> and shrunk him now there's not many of you that are my vintage and means that you know when you're a kid there a movie came out honey I shrunk the kids um, there's a few of us we're having a revival right now uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, it's kind of like, sometimes I think it's like the church, you know, Jesus is saying to the, well, the church is saying to God, uh, honey, I shrunk Jesus, you know, and, and it's not far off reality because, well, how do we do it? I haven't got time for the historical context of that, but it, it's like, we, well intended, we've tried to reduce the gospel so it's, it's easy and palatable to understand, but in doing so, we've made formulas or four spiritual laws or something else, and we've reduced it just usually to deal with one aspect of human need and stripped it, I think, of its power to revolutionize the world. Oh, for a generation, a church in today's day and age that would become gospel-centric again, gospel-cultured again, and change the world. So, the apostles, by the way, refused to condense the gospel to a formula. Like you ask Matthew, hey, Matthew, what's the gospel? Oh, well, let me write a book, the gospel according to Matthew. <laughs> Which is not just about his birth, it's also about his life. When we get to atonement, we'll talk about why that's important. Uh, but, you know, it's also about his death, it's also about his resurrection, it's also about his ascension, and it's also about his return, the whole picture. I think today what we've done is we've looked for in the gospel something that's easy to be quite easily, quickly understand, and we've looked for the salvation aspect of it. Now, salvation is part of the gospel, no, make no doubt about it. Is it the full gospel? Well, well, let's have a consideration of that. In reaching for the message of the gospel we just, uh, and, and trying to make it simple, we just drew out in the more modern times the salvation aspect. Which is, I, I, 
in my next slide here kind of gives you an overview of what I think the salvation message is. Um, uh, in contemporary culture, it's just like, you know, God loves you, you've messed up, Jesus died for you, ask him into your heart and you go to heaven. Is that the gospel? Not according to Paul in Romans chapter 1. Is it part of the gospel? Yes. But if that's all we've got, I want to suggest to you humbly this morning, we've stripped it a lot of its power. To make it easy, to make it palatable, to make it so like, oh, well, I just, want, I just want a Jesus that I can just fit into my life. So if I just have to ask him for forgiveness and he gets to, you know, I get to go to heaven one day, there you go, I can get on with the rest of my life. I don't want a Jesus that's going to inconvenience my whole life and call, uh, call me to take up my cross to follow him. I want Jesus on my terms. Well, guess what? You didn't get Jesus You got your own figment of your own imagination edition. How are we doing? I love you. I'm saying it in love because I want you to meet Jesus. I want you to encounter the gospel and it's bigger and it's better and it's more life-changing and it's more powerful than what we've imagined. And I am, I don't know how many years deep, uh, quite a few, uh, in exploring the gospel. And I'm like, ah, I'm mind blown. I want to know it more. And God, let the gospel change and transform me. I'm in the middle of the study at the moment. And I know looming my, my 12th paper and my, my, uh, my uh, uh, whatever I'm doing, my course I'm doing at the moment, I've got to have a capstone paper where I have to choose. And I'm like, how am I not going to choose the gospel? Because I want to know the gospel. So, you know, I kind of, you know, well, Jesus loves me. He forgave me of my sin. And great, that's good. Tuck him in there and go on with my life. Now, it's not that this is not in the gospel. It's just that it's an aspect of. The problem of this is all we know of the gospel is that discipleship's not necessary. And if you have a gospel where discipleship is not accounted for and necessary, you don't have the gospel. We'll see that. Uh, this, this gospel doesn't require you to leave a life of sin necessarily. That's problematic when you compare it with Paul's gospel. Um, th- this, this gospel negates the central theme of the gospel, which is the kingdom of heaven coming on earth as in heaven. That's the central theme of the gospel. The world getting to look like what Jesus wants it to look like. Starting with my reconciliation, salvation with God and moving on from there. Uh, you know, so this is, this is a bit problematic. This, uh, if, if, by the way, if, if Jesus coming, his kingdom coming, his reign and rule coming on earth is not central to the gospel, chances are we're following Pluto more than the Bible. Pl- Pluto. Hey, Pluto. Uh, no, Plato. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Plato, Plato, the philosopher, Plato had this idea that there's this upstairs, downstairs part of reality and upstairs is spiritual and we we hope to kind of be more like that. Downstairs is the natural world and our carnal, you know, all of our body and everything like that and that's not spiritual. It was Plato that had the idea. In fact, one of his uh, disciples, Plutarch, went on and said, he said this idea, he said, yeah, 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 when we die, our, our spirit, the good part of us goes and reunites with God again and that's it and we're just looking for that day. That was Plutarch's teaching, who really influenced the early fathers of the church because they were in that culture, and so they wrestled with those things, and that's where a lot of that thinking sort of, sort of came in. But the gospel has to do with God bringing his kingdom here on earth, his rule and reign in my life, his rule and reign through my life, his setting my world right, me right, and then the world right through me. So isn't it interesting that I've got to do so much work to convince you of what the gospel is? Because I kind of I see the cogs turning, eh? I'm like, oh, yep, yep, okay, great, we'll hang around. This is going to be fun. Uh, you know, you are the center, center of that message, not Jesus. 
and it doesn't produce necessarily radical life change. So we have a Jesus that hopefully fits conveniently into my life. What is the gospel then, you ask? Well, I, I, I can't give it to you in a couple of moments, apart from probably Paul's best snapshot there is a righteousness that's come from God through faith. And, and then 1 Corinthians 15, it tells you that it centers on Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and that's really important. And there's a passage in 1 Thessalonians that we looked at. And so they kind of, you know, kind of summarizes and the creeds is helpful because that's an attempt to put 1 Corinthians 15 into a context of a belief statement. Let me give you what I think is a contour of the gospel this morning, just because, you know, I think we can draw out major themes. And I think that would be helpful. And it starts with God's design and desire. It moves into rejection and disorder, redemption and response, and then discipleship and restoration. Firstly, design and desire. There is a God who created all things, heaven and earth, all things in it for his good pleasure. He's a loving God, a holy God, a just God. He created you different to the rest of creation. He created us in a garden called Eden, a place where we were humanity and God dwelt together in perfect union and intimacy, experiencing the adventure of life and the perfection of creation the way that God had it in mind. It's, it, it, the gospel starts and ends with God, His desire, His plans, His purposes, His beauty, his magnificence, it moves then into the rejection of humanity. We rejected God. We call that sin today, but we make sin justice, breaking God's laws. And it is that, but it's more than that. It's a rejection of who God is and His way, and that you setting yourself up as God. That's kind of the essence of sin. And so we kind of, in doing that, we, in the Garden of Eden, we do it all the same as that we reject God's ways, we reject God's will, we ruptured relationship with God. When we ruptured relationship with God, we ruptured relationship with each other and relationship with humanity. And there's this chaos that ensues in our world. There's this pain and suffering that God never wanted us to experience, that we see around us all day, every day, because of a rejection of uh, every kind of distortion, including death, came into existence, and still we choose to worship created things instead of the Creator. And the next phase is this redemption and response phase that God sent into motion a plan beginning with Israel, culminating with Christ. Jesus, the God-man, fully God, fully man, lived a life a certain way to represent what the kingdom looks like on earth, died a cruel death as an atonement, a sacrifice. We'll look at that more specifically. He was raised from the dead, overcoming sin and death, and then was ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father, which means he then became king of heaven and earth. But there's a response that it requires of us to engage in that. And the Bible calls that response repentance and faith in Jesus. We repent. We're going to explain what that means. This is the subjective aspect of atonement. There's a repentance required. And if we don't understand and repeat, understand repentance and the ongoing nature of it, again, we don't understand the gospel. If we don't understand faith and what that means, it's not just a mental ascent. It's more than that. It's richer than that. It's more powerful than that. But it's putting a trust in his work solely and only, not in good works, but we respond by repentance and faith and put our trust and our loyalty and our faithfulness in Jesus, our Savior and our King, two sides of the same coin, to accept Jesus and surrender to, so He can accept us. He becomes Savior and He becomes Lord. We've heard that before. Savior is that His works that done it all for us. Lord is that He gets place number one in our lives. And a lot of people want Jesus Savior without Jesus Lord, and you can't have it because it's one person. And He comes as He is. Or maybe we've got a figment of our own imagination. And then it moves into restoration and discipleship. God's mission, God's worldwide restoration project that he set in motion to restore the ruptures between humanity and God, right? It's the salvation piece. Critically important. We know what we're saved from. Do we know what we're saved for? We're saved to be brought 
into God's great worldwide restoration project, to play our part in it, to represent Him well, to bring His kingdom here on earth, to reveal it, to reflect it to humanity, to be a light, to be a salt. Jesus' life, the life He lived in many ways was the prototype of the new humanity that His death and resurrection was bringing to birth. And we get to be like Christ on the earth. We are becoming like Him. This is the discipleship piece. We are growing in this understanding of who He is. We are allowing the gospel to change and transform us. So that everywhere we walk, we can bring or show the world at least a snapshot of what Jesus' rule and reign looks like here on earth. That when there's a poor person, it looks like help. When there's sickness, it looks like healing or mercy. When there's injustice, it looks like a desire to bring injustice. Where there's loneliness, there is friendship, right? This is what the kingdom looks like. This is, what, this is part of the gospel, that we are called to be discipled into the ways of Jesus, to reflect it to the world, that others might hear, that others might receive Jesus as King and Lord, Savior, It's all part of this beautiful message of the gospel. We're on mission. Another another thing I could say, an implication in that, is that when I stop being transformed, the gospel has stopped being active in my life. How we get transformed by the gospel, that's a great conversation. Let's get to that. Not today. And we're on a mission until he comes again and completes what he began. Some implications. The gospel centers around Jesus and not us. We learn to put him in the center and we're incorporated into his worldwide restoration project. Central to our response is a turning from all other idols, all other loyalties, all other allegiances, is surrendering to the new life as Jesus is king. And the last implication is that the gospel changes everything. It changes everything. Every aspect of my life that sin wrecked, I'm a, on a journey of reclaiming. Firstly, relationship with God through the finished work of Christ. It's really important I stress that. <laughs> but as I walk with Him, a restoration of my humanity in its fullness as Christ's life. And then, what does that look like in the world around me? (laughs) Setting the world right again. A righteousness from heaven is revealed. What does that righteousness look like in me? What does that righteousness look like through me? These are all aspects we're going to have to dig into to understand the gospel better. But the gospel is bigger and better than we think. So here we're not going to shrink it down. To something that maybe helps you one day in the future. To this powerful, profound, life-changing call to be caught up in God's oiled wide restoration project that centers around the person and the work of Jesus and a response of faith and trust to follow him. Because it means also that relationships get reconciled, right? It it means also that your life has significant purpose because God's purposes are significant. It means that every area of sin and the shame and where the devil's schemes are get to become overturned in our lives, right? Oh, where have we bowed down to fear or an addiction or, or some sort of something from our past that we've written ourselves off? The gospel is about walking out of that and walking into wholeness and healing and abundance and flourishing, Jesus' vision of flourishing, right? This is all part of the gospel. That we get to make a difference in this city, Ototahi. That there's so many 
that are away from God, that we get to play a part in presenting the gospel so that they can be reconciled to God, have their lives reconciled to a righteousness that looks like His will and purposes, and then spill out into overturning injustices and overturning the power of sickness and mental health and all these things which are holding people back from the fullness of what God has in mind. That's the part of the mission of the gospel that we're part of. And I think we need to believe the gospel again. And in believing the gospel again, believe that our lives can be radically transformed and changed. And in believing the gospel again, believing that we have a part to play in bringing radical change and transformation in the city. Because the gospel is bigger and the gospel is better than the shrunk down version that we've settled for at times. Amen. Would you stand to your feet this morning, church? There's a little introduction to where we're going. This is a day of good news. Friend, if you're here today, this is a day of good news. If you don't know God, it's a day of good news. Jesus' work and life and work on the cross is death, burial, and resurrection means that there is a fresh start available for you today if you'd put your trust in Him. For all of us, every aspect of our lives which are not in line with the vision of God's vision of flourishing for us, it's a day of good news. The gospel going deeper is about transforming all of that. And there's a beautiful message we realize that we've been caught up into this incredible mission of seeking to set the world right. And so God, let the gospel go deeper in our lives again. Let the eyes of our heart be opened to the beauty, to the power and the profoundness and the potential of the gospel. The day that we would say, like Paul, we're not ashamed of the gospel. And we'd grow in our ability to state that. Because it is the power of God unto salvation. A righteousness what's come from heaven. And from beginning to end, a people who are just living by faith in the light of this righteousness. So change us, God, as we seek to embrace, wrestle, and sit in the power and the profoundness of the gospel. If you're here today and you're like, man, I think, I think, I think. Somewhere along the line, the gospel of my Jesus did get shrunk. And I've tucked them in my back pocket somewhere. And your heart today is to say, God, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for shrinking you down so I could make you conveniently a little part of my life. Just do business with God. I want to re- receive and respond to you afresh as my Savior and as my Lord. King of heaven and earth. That I may behold you as you are. Thank you, Lord. Come on, just close your eyes across this place and just reflect on Jesus this morning.